Good afternoon, social media. I hope everybody's doing good today. Hey, I want to talk to you guys about how you, in this season that we go through, some of you, um, if you're Christians, you know, and you see all of these things going on, and you're maybe you're conservatives, uh, and you see a lot of these things going on, and maybe you're just a person that doesn't really have a political affiliation at all, and you're just seeing these things going on around the world and in our country, and you're feeling discouraged and tired. I invite you to stick around and listen to this message. I just got out of the gym a little while ago, so I'm not like usually dressed up for these these little videos that I usually make. I'm talking always about Bible studies now. It's rarely, I used to come on and talk politics quite a bit back in like 2015, 2016, but I've completely transitioned over now to mostly faith-based topics and I'm regarding scripture. We're in a very difficult spiritual battle for the soul of our country and it doesn't matter if you believe that or not, if you think that's what's going on or not. A lot of us who have been reading our Bibles most of our lives understand we're in a spiritual battle and so I like to take time out of my life once in a while to get on here and share scripture with people because scriptures is what's going to change people's lives. And so there's a lot of people that are just tired and discouraged. I read their social media posts and, you know, there's people with suicidal thoughts and just a lot of different things going on in their life. And uh, I wanted to just come on here and share a few scriptures with you. Hopefully, hopefully you'll get something out of this and maybe you'll say a little prayer, you know, at the end of this video and you'll be hopefully... Um, getting something from the Lord to give you some strength, some encouragement to recharge your batteries, you know. And uh, I'm going to be reading some scriptures today out of the, the Good News Bible translation. You know, when I got saved a long time ago, one of the very first Bibles that I read, um, when I didn't know what I was doing a whole heck of a lot, was I was reading out of a Good News Bible because my grandmother bought me this Bible that she felt like at my age I would be able to understand, you know. And I, uh, you know where that Bible is today? And I, you know, like, this is like peeling the onion back in my life, you know. <laughs> I usually am selective about what I peel back on that onion, you know, personally, okay. Like, I don't tell everybody my deepest personal details. I'm too shy for that compared to what some other people do on social media. They talk about everything and, you know, it's like, nah. I think I'll save that. <laughs> okay, this good news Bible that my grandmother gave me, it was one of the most valuable possessions that I ever owned. Okay, personally speaking, it's not a it's not a really fancy expensive car in the in the garage or maybe a favorite gun or a fishing pole or a bowling ball or a cue stick or some sport that you like or some hobby that you like. No, this to me was the most valuable thing that I ever owned because I had it with me almost since day one when I got saved, okay? I have somewhere I'm going with this. I'm gonna just tell you some things that lead up to these scriptures that I'm gonna share with you because I'm reading it out of good news and I know that there's a lot of King James only people here and it's fine. I agree with you. I'm not into getting any kind of, you know, mm, biblical debates about these other translations of scripture. Okay, that's not why I'm here tonight. I'm just giving you real talk. I'm giving you real talk about what happened to me. I, as I got older, I started reading other translations and then I, I settled on King James, just personally, okay? Because I know it's a very, very good translation. But back then, I was reading my Good News Bible and this Bible today that I had, that my grandmother wrote this little special, special message for me and many years ago, uh, she wrote it usually in the front cover of your Bible. You get a little note, you know. And um, she was wishing me the best that I would grow in the Lord and stuff like that. And that Bible today is, is something that I put with my mom when we laid her to rest in 2020. And I thought, what well, was the last thing that I could do that I could give up a special possession that I had? the last thing that I could possibly do for my mom before I buried my mom. And I thought about, okay, it's my Bible, the one that my grandmother gave me. And so I wrote a long note 
and I put it in that Bible and I told my mom, I said, I will see you very soon. Long story short, and I put the Bible, I gave it to them and I said, put that with my mom. So that's there, okay? But it's a good news Bible. And I just wanna tell some people about um, how God rolls with you in your life, okay? This is real talk I'm giving you. I'm giving you not my full testimony this evening, but I'm gonna give you some real talk, okay? Whether you understand this or not, you know, if you're saved or not, if you're saved, you'll probably understand it a little better than unsaved people. <clears throat> maybe the unsaved people will get saved from this video. Maybe they, maybe some will, maybe most probably won't, but some might. And what I wanna tell you about your born again experience is that God's been preparing that for you since day one, that you have, a, God has a plan for you. And as I've advanced in my years, I start to look back and I see how God's plan was unfolding in my life. Now, maybe it's not so easy to see when you're actually going through it, but when you have time to sit back and reflect, you're going, yeah. And so around the age that I got saved, was very young, uh, my grandmother used to come and visit my parents and she would take me back on the Amtrak train to Arizona and I was really, really young, okay? But one of the first things that she did with me, now think about God's working in your life when I give you this quick little story. All right, consider that, okay? Because God is working, he works through people, he works through circumstances and he works through situations. Whether you understand that or not, that's what's going on. So she would take me to her house and um, she used to like to show me off to her neighbors, you know, my grandson and everything. But then um, in the morning time, whether we went into town on a public bus or whatever, but she pulled out a bunch of yard tools out of her garage. And these tools were not the best tools in the world. They were dull. They weren't, you know, fancy, smancy stuff. I had push lawnmower, one of those blade push things, and it was dull, man, it was so dull. That thing was rusty. That, I had a hoe, I had a rake. And these weeds, they were tall in her backyard because she had a septic tank that her grand, uh, sorry, her father built, okay, with my grandfather, They he was a contractor. And so the septic tank caused all these weeds, she had like a quarter of an acre of property in the backyard, and, um, and so she would give me all those tools and, and it was hot in Arizona in the summertime. I, she says, David, you need to get out there and starve before that sun comes up. And I was like, okay, grandma, all right. You know, this is a different time and a different generation back then, guys. You know, when these kids today, they just have their hand out like this, right? And boy, if they have to do something to earn it, they're just having a temper tantrum, right? Not, not in my generation, guys, not when I was a kid. That's not the way it worked in my family. Now, my grandmother rarely disciplined me physically. Like when I was really young, she did. But when I got a little older, she stopped doing that. And when I was like 12 years old, she wasn't doing that anymore. But she was just, she was like, she gave me the tools. I went out there and I started like at eight in the morning and I would hoe those weeds down all day, all day, take a break, go back out there, drink water all day in the heat. And then around the evening time, when they were all down, I had everything all raped up, she would come outside and she's like, wow, David, you did so amazing. And I didn't, I, was, I didn't have my hand out. I wasn't asking for anything. I wasn't expecting to be paid. Anything that she needed around that house, anything cleaning, whatever, I did it. And I wasn't expecting me, she's my grandmother. I did it, you know, but here's what would happen. Some time would go by, we would hop on a bus and she would take me to the mall buy me clothes, buy me a steak dinner, anything that I, you know, like just, I didn't ask for it, but she would do that. So it was kind of like a give and take thing. Like she knew I earned it, but she wasn't like telling me that, but she just was teaching me. Okay. Why am I bringing that story up? Because I'm telling you when God is preparing something for you in your life, it usually starts at a very early age. He's starting you and he's putting you through situations that don't feel comfortable and it's it's not easy to go through and you're like I don't like this this is not fun you know fast forward to a couple of years later 
I started learning, uh, I started really getting into sports. And I'm getting to the scriptures, so just hang with me. I'm building to it because I know that there's a lot of Christians out there that are tired. You're, you know, and you feel like you don't have the energy and the stamina to keep going. You see all this garbage going on. This is why I'm sharing this story with you, okay? I want you guys to, I want you, now look, I get tired. I get sometimes, when my discouragement comes, I never think about giving up. I just like sometimes get angry, right? And I'll end up saying or reacting in a way that <laughs> may not, um, you know, like, be in the best interest of the kingdom of heaven. Let's put it like that, okay? And then I have to repent later. But I try to avoid that if I can. I, when people are insulting me on social media, it's, that's easy to do. I can totally give it back to them probably better. I could get down in the dirt and roll with the pigs. I could, I mean, haven't we all done that? Like, of course I can. And I've got a special gift for it. But I, I, that's not the way God wants us to roll, okay? We're representing him now. So we're not supposed to be doing those things. So, of course, I can do that. But I'm like, okay, so how much more of this am I going to be able to take? Okay. Now, when I got into sports, I wanted to play baseball really bad. And it, I was good at it. The reason why, you know, like when you, the reason why you usually want to play a sport is because you're good at it, right? When I was in school, um, the coaches at the school wanted me to play really bad. And I was ready to sign up. And my dad said, no, you're going to be, you're going to be learning how to box. You're going to start boxing. And I'm like, okay, dad, I, I want to do that, but I love playing baseball. And he goes, you can do that later. He goes, I want you to know, like, it's a tradition in our family. My dad did it and he was, he was, he, <laughs> he was good. Okay. He was good. It was not his profession, but he, when he went through his age of teenage and <clears throat> early twenties up till he got through the military, he did it. And then he finally got out. But I mean, it was a tradition in our family because we have a famous boxer in our our um family line okay so it's like we had to follow the tradition whatever i love it okay but it's not like it's something that i got in and got out before i got too hurt but i learned and he's like no i want you to know how to do this and it comes in handy guys <laughs> like it has in the past but anyway when i was a certain age i started boxing and um here's the story he invested a lot of money into this it was not like an old shack somewhere with a membership. It was like a really, really good one in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was prominent there. And they taught karate and judo and all this other stuff and boxing, you know. But the karate and the uh, jiu-jitsu guys and the ju judo guys, I should say, were on the top floor. And us boxers were on the bottom floor. And they all came down. And we always called like Wednesday night fights, okay. There was probably eight or nine of us boxers all around the same age. So there were some other guys who were older than me. They were like 17, 18 years old. And um, remember, keep in mind that I'm, I'm giving you the story not to t talk about myself or brag about myself, but to give you an example of how God works, okay? Because I feel like through these situations, he was preparing me for moments like we're going through right now, okay? To like armor me up, make me tough, make me not just physically tough, but mentally tough as well. So like... It's more than just being physically tough in this generation, in this season, guys. It's more God can give you the strength, okay, to get through anything, both spiritually, mentally, and physically. So, like, I'm not talking about being an athlete. I'm talking about more about having that energy to get up the next day and reading your Bible, being disciplined, okay? Um, in God's army, in God's family, in God's community, born-again Christians, are we're, dis we're a disciplined bunch, Okay, I'm not talking about works to go to heaven. I'm, I'm saying that the Lord wants us to be disciplined. He wants us to be educated. He wants us to be in prayer. He wants us to be doing all of those important things that he tells us to do. So when I went through these sporting situations, it kind of was preparing me for now. I feel like all of what I went through when I was younger was preparing me for this season that we're living in. I'm going to give you the, some of the examples in scripture and then we're going to be done. Okay, hopefully this won't be too long. Um, Scott says you were being conditioned for your future and Scott here's the here's the uh, spoiler alert for the audience tonight every single one of us are being conditioned for our future in fact I'm not saying, saying that God's done conditioning me yet like there's more until it's time to leave until I'm done or it's time to be raptured um, he's still conditioning me and the other thing is I don't want to get too cocky before the Lord saying, I'm ready, 
you know, because as soon as I tell God I'm ready, put me to the test, I'll trip fast. Okay, I've learned to really, <laughs> I take the humble approach these days when it comes to that because we can all trip, stumble, and fall. But when I was uh, going through this whole boxing training thing, long story short, okay, um, I was getting my butt kicked like for the first three to four weeks of, of the school. Okay, and on Wednesday, we called it Wednesday night fight. So like we trained like three to four days a week, but then on Wednesday, I had to be there around six in the evening to compete. And um, I had to go through this little crucible of qualifications as well. So like when I was being qualified by the coaches, um, I had to pass a certain um, set of, of uh, prerequisites. In other words, uh, could I, was I able to do this? Was I able to memorize this? Was I able to physically do this and that? Because they don't want people getting hurt in the club, okay? And after I went through all of those tasks, my dad said to them, he said, did my son pass? And they said, oh, there's no problem with that. We're very excited about having your son here. So that made me feel good. I'm like, all right, you know, yeah, this is great. I'm ready to roll, you know? And as soon as I got into the ring, there's this one kid and he outweighed me by like 40 pounds and all muscle too, okay? He was their, he was their boy, okay? And I even remember his, his name. His name was Steve Lombardi, okay? And Steve was the badass of the, of the sorry about that, Christians. He was the badass of the, of the club. Same age as me. He was, he was the guy that was just beating up everybody and he had no mercy on any of us. Like, um, when it was my turn to go, like they would, we had about eight or nine of us kids, right? And all the karate guys would come down, all the judo guys, they all wanted to watch us brawl. Okay. And so when I got through my training, like they would put the mouthpiece in the headgear on and it was just all out. He, all he wanted to do was get me to knock me down, knock me out, whatever he could do. Right. And so when I was in there. Uh, the first thing that happened to me when I was in there with him the first time was he hit me in the stomach so hard it took all of the air out of out of my lungs like and I dropped to one knee and I was trying to catch my breath I was not down I was not finished I got back up but that was like literally took the took the breath out of my lungs and I got back up and took my beating right I was throwing punches but I took my beating and then all the other kids took their beatings too. And after about three weeks of that, I told my dad, like, I said, look, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I don't want to do this anymore. I'm getting my butt kicked every, every Wednesday by this kid and I don't want to do it. Think about the Lord, okay? When you go to, we're going to read, but we're going to read something out of Jeremiah here in a minute. I'm complaining to my dad. I'm saying, look, I don't want to, I don't want to be there anymore because it's, you know, taking a beating is one thing. I can take the beating, but I'm not enjoying it. And my dad said, look, I'm not letting you give up. But we're going to change the routine a little bit. And I said, what do you mean? How, how can we do that? Because they're coaching me down there. And he said, no, from you're going to have some private training here at the house. And he said, from now on, you're going to be fighting me every evening. And I'm like, oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> All right. But he's my dad, right? He's not going to pummel me, but... Here's what ended up happening was like every day he trained me a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, hitting me a little bit harder, causing me, teaching me defense, uh, causing me to be quick with my hands. And I got used to boxing with my dad every single night and he didn't always go easy on me. He kept up a little bit higher of a pace than I could handle, but enough that <clears throat> he was telling me where I was making my mistakes and you know, and so the thing is with the with the coaches down at the gym, guys, was that they were very political. So like, they, they had my best interests in mind, but they didn't feel like I had put my time in. So the other kid was their was their boy. Okay, he was like, he was the popular uh, guy that was there, the kid, and everybody, all the coaches loved him. Okay, and he was he was Mr. Bully. Okay, you ever meet a bully before? You know, we got a lot of bullies running around in our country today. You know, nothing changes. Same thing back then. So here's what happened. Like after I started training with my dad personally, um, it was like, I want to say month two, month three, things started to turn around. And as soon as I got my 
uh, got the ground under my feet and I started, my cardio was building up. I was this skinny kid. I was not like, I didn't have like lots of muscle, but when I hit, I hit hard. So like, especially with the, the left hand because I was a lefty. And so what happened was, is that it started turning around. I started beating this kid. Um, he would swing at me and he was, I was causing him to miss. My footwork was really good. And I would always ask my dad, I was looking at him instead of the coaches and the coaches started not liking that because they're, they're the guys that are supposed to be telling me what to do. And I asked my dad, I said, okay, what round do you want me to go after him in? Was it because we, we, we would fight for like three rounds and he's like, I want you to, I want you to go after him all the way in the first round. And so that's what I would do. I, I just let it go. And he say, he had a saying for me. He's like, let your dogs go. Right. So sometimes in life you have to hold your hands up and defend yourself. And there's other times where you have to let your dogs go. And when he would tell me to let my dogs go, that's what I was doing. And I was, I literally turned that whole situation around. He was not the bully anymore. Okay, I was not bullying him, but I got a lot of payback on that kid. And all everybody came down when it was time for him and I to fight. They all watched us, all right? And so the cool thing was, is I pretty much destroyed their boy's reputation. And it was thanks to my dad, okay, who, who had more of an interest in me than the coaches did. But it, there was some political stuff going on there to where you know, they were kind of like, they didn't like it because I was this kid that had only been there for a few months and all of a sudden it turned around. And when I was sparring with the other kids, I was not bullying the other kids like he did. I fought to their level. Like I would spar with them to their level. I wasn't like pounding on them like the other kid Steve did, was doing with them. I, I didn't pound on them. I fought to their level because I, I wasn't a bully. Like I didn't want to bully anybody. I wanted to be able to perform well and practice and obviously hit when you need to hit, but I was not like trying to knock them out or anything like that kid was doing to everybody else. Right. But <laughs> there was this newfound respect for me after that. It was so cool. So like, why am I telling you this is the reason why I'm telling you the story is because, um, God puts you through these crucibles at times and you feel like you can't handle all the stress, but he's, He's doing it for you to develop your character, to, to um, weed out those unhealthy, you know, like bad habits that you might have or whatever. And, and a lot of times, guys, uh, in this life, it's, it's difficult, but God has a plan in it. And he works through, he works through people and situations and circumstances to make you, to grow your character, to be stronger, to have more discipline. Okay. And um, you don't have to be a boxer or an athlete or, you know, baseball player or, or whatever sport, you know, like, but I'm talking about in general is like, and that's one thing that I learned about as I got older. Um, I'm a has been now. I'm not a boxer anymore. I don't, that's not what my priority, you know, what my priority is now. My priority is doing those things for the Lord now and studying his, his word because he's been preparing me for this moment. And I feel like he's prepared a lot of you for your moments too. I was listening to a podcast the other night, the other night from Now the End Begins, and uh, Jeffrey was playing some of these clips from these churches we got going on in America. And I mean, guys, like, it's bad. It's so bad in some of these churches. They're like, it's like seances. They're the worship is like seances, and you had this really creepy, eerie feeling going through you when you listen to that. And I was like, um, this one lady, I forgot her name, right? She, she was advising Donald Trump uh, as, you know, as a Christian, supposed Christian, right? And all she was doing in this church service, she was literally saying, strike and 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 strike. And I'm like, what has that got to do with anything? Like she's asking God to strike and strike and strike and strike what? Like, and it was almost like lulling you into some kind of a, a trance. Like, I just got this icky feeling. And then there's this other, was this other guy on the, on the podcast that he was just, man, these people are nutcases, guys. It does, has nothing to do with God or the Holy Spirit. Now, what are we going to do as Bible-believing Christians? Are we going to stand out up against that? Are we going to stand up against what they're promoting? Um, 
Look at Tucker Carlson's videos. They've censored any. I mean, I got one video to go through today and the, all the other ones were blocked. They're blocking because they don't, they don't want the truth to come out <clears throat> and you get discouraged. You get discouraged because you think, oh, I, I can't do this. I can't put up with Facebook anymore. I can't put up with social media. You know, it's all been taken over. Look, my perspective is that, is that we're working in enemy territory, okay? And this is what we do as, as believers is right. Jonah went to Nineveh. Nineveh was like a, a type of America. Now, Nineveh was, was a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners, okay? Not all of us, okay? Don't get me wrong, but a lot, I mean, America and Nineveh was a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners. And Jonah had to go there and preach repentance. Eh, eh, hint, repentance, repent, because God is going to destroy this city in a certain amount of days. They repented because... Uh, Jonah should have been dead, okay? He should have been dead by the whale. And the fishermen told the whole city, look, this dude, we threw him in the ocean and we saw him get swallowed by a great fish. He should not be here. It's a miracle. And that's why they repented, okay? But I'm telling you, if you're going to, let me start reading you some scripture. This is, this is the Good News Bible translation, okay? Let me start reading this. I feel like it's important. Um, and, you know, look, I... I'm not going to tell you that I get discouraged and I don't get tired and and things like that. But you know, the Holy Spirit just has a way of recharging you. He really does. And I don't have to go to some Laodicean church and having somebody per, uh, perform these seances. And it's just, ugh, right? I mean, worshiping God is one thing. That's something we were created to do. But man, what I heard in that, that was like, wow, that's wicked evil. Like, so speaking out against that. I had so much pushback over Asbury. I had so much pushback over this, these fake revivals. People insulting me and threatening me because I'm, I dare to question the movement, right? Well, if I, if, I tell, if I get discouraged over their scorn, the Lord is telling me in scripture, how are you gonna run with the horses? Let's, let's do this, okay? Let me, um, this is, you know, Jeremiah's complaint about his situation. In verse 3 of Jeremiah 12, he says, But Lord, you know me. You see what I do. You know, And you know how I love you. Okay? Drag these evil people away like sheep to be butchered. Like, this is what Jeremiah is asking God to do, right? You know, do you know anybody that's like asking God to punish these wicked evil people that we got today? Look, we don't have to ask him. We know it's going to happen. You know, we don't have to be... Guard, guard them until it's time for them to be slaughtered. How long will our land be dry and the grass of the field be withered? Animals and birds are dying because of the wickedness of our people. We have train derailments. I think there's sabotage, etc. People who say God doesn't see what we're doing. And here's the Lord's response to Jeremiah. He says, Jeremiah, if you get tired racing against people, this is good news translation. I understand King James is the best, but just, you know, pacify some of us for tonight. This is the Bible that I read for the first time, okay? So I'm just doing it because I feel like that's what I need to do, all right? Some of you uh, Pharisees, take, it, take a day off, all right? Um, Jeremiah, if you get tired racing against people, how can you race against horses? If you can't even stand up in the open country... How will you manage in the jungle by the Jordan? Even if your relatives, members of your own family have betrayed you, they join in the attacks against you. Do not trust them even though they speak friendly words. Okay? So God is telling Jeremiah, he's like, look, you can't handle some criticism. You know, like in Jeremiah, I mean, you know, they, were, they persecuted him physically, guys. Not just, not just with words. We get all discouraged and tired because of these words and these lies and these deceptions and like, but you're not like physically persecuted yet. You know, not, I mean, maybe some people have been, you know, like in America over their faith. But I mean, for the most part, we're on social media hanging out and we're struggling with these people. And it's like, God's saying to us, like, don't get discouraged about that. Like, you really? Like, how are you going to run with horses? Who are the horses in Jeremiah? The horses are the evil spirits that we struggle against, the demonic uh, forces of Ephesians chapter 6. 
Um, Sister Diane, good to see you and all the family. Thanks for coming on tonight. Ginger, Patty, Cindy, Scott, Brother Scott was here. I think he's still here. Um, we're going to be doing Revelation 17 and 18 pretty soon, guys, with Brother Scott. So that's going to be really exciting. We've been talking about our plans for that. And um, we're going to be building a case, okay? And so you can come to your own conclusions when we're finished with that case. But it's going to be a very interesting topic of discussion in Revelation 17 and 18. All right, I'm going to read something to you about an example of God giving somebody strength when they were discouraged. There was a confrontation, which some of you already know this, maybe many of you already know this. Ahab, um, Ahab summoned all the Israelites and the prophets of Baal. This is in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 20, okay? Ahab summoned all the Israelites and the prophets of Baal to meet at Mount Carmel. Elijah went up to the people and said, how much longer? This is, this is a confrontation that you and I, you that love the Lord, that love your Bible and me, we are having a confrontation with these people that are in walking and living in deception. Okay, Same thing right here. Elijah says, how much longer will it take you to make up your minds? If the Lord is God, then worship him, okay? But if Baal is God, worship him. But the people didn't say a word. You know, there's people masquerading God, but they're really serving Baal in today's uh, season right now. Baal is a evil, wicked, uh, fallen angel, demonic entity that promotes abortion, that promotes LGBTQ, that promotes all these. Nothing's changed, guys. They just have different names, okay? But that's really what this confrontation is all about. And <clears throat> these people didn't have the courage to say a thing. You want to know why? Because they were caught in their own intellectual idolatry. And and Elijah's saying, look, you've got to make up your minds. Don't pretend to be a Christian and say you're serving Jesus when you don't have an altar call or, or a repentance a message of repentance of your sins and what a true born again experience is, is Elijah's telling everybody, make up your mind. If you're going to serve God, make up your mind and serve him. Read your Bible, read what it says, read how to be, have a born again experience and be safe. But you can't play both sides of the fence. You can't worship Baal and you can't worship God at the same time. It's literally it's stupid. It makes no sense unless you're literally trying to deceive and trick people. Okay. And there were these people that were deceiving others. You know, but it's a counterfeit. We have a, we had a counterfeit Christianity today, and there was a counterfeit god in that time called Baal. And the Baal god is the same with a small g, not a real god, but a small uh, counterfeit of the real god. The people didn't say a word. So Elijah said, "Am I the only prophet of of the Lord still left?" But there are four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal. That's like we feel outnumbered in our country today, don't we? We feel outnumbered. We feel like you know, look at all of these people, right? The, the, the masses going for, for, for the wrong stuff. And you dare speak out against those 450 false prophets of Baal and they're all going to turn on you and threaten you and tell you you're an idiot because you read the Bible and you take it literally. They don't even say that. You know what happens to me in a lot of these conversations on social media? Um, they tell me I'm an idiot and some experiences that I've had with God, like they want to tell me it didn't happen. But they, they don't quote one scripture. Or if they do, they're talking about Roman Catholicism or, uh, or uh, maybe even um, uh, Jewish you know, rabbis or whatever. Like they're not, they're not, in other words, they don't know Bible. They're like biblically illiterate. So this is like what we're struggling with. We're struggling with false prophets. We're struggling with people that don't know. And then they would rather argue with you than reason with you. There's a difference between debating and arguing like let's reason together all right let's see if we can find some common ground which we would like to go to the bible and find the common ground right i don't care about being right and you shouldn't um let's find out if god's right we both of us don't have to be right but let's see what the bible says and let's see if we can find common ground so like this is an ultimate test here at mount carmel and then once i get through this little story i'll kind of be done <laughs> Minette says they're probably vile to me when I uh, dared to question the uh, 
Kentucky College Revival, their comments were attacks, not debate. To me, that isn't how Christians act. And the best way to handle that, Manette, and this is where I'm still going through this myself, is like you want to react in the flesh and roll around with them in the mud because they insult you, they tell you're an idiot, they attack you verbally and all that stuff. It's very tempting to do, but what we've got to do is use their use their actions and their words against them. And what I mean by that is like, um, I had one guy, I'll give you an example and then I'll keep reading here, okay? I had like one guy give me an example. He, he, he sent me his blessings, right? And he was making fun of me. He was making fun of my one of my experiences with the Lord. He was making, literally laughing at me. And they go, oh, I'm just kidding. I'm bless you, you know? Then he came back a few minutes later and he says, you're an idiot, okay? So like, I got a blessing and a curse out of it. So how do I react as a Christian? Do I wanna insult him back and say, no, you're an idiot. You're, you're the one who's really the idiot. You know, like, do I wanna go down that rabbit trail or would I rather quote the scripture that says, Paul Todd told us about blessings and curses shouldn't come out of the same, your, your mouth, you know, like out of the same mouth, right? We shouldn't bless people and curse people out of the same mouth. So I, I let him know about that. We, we need to like use the word of God as our two-edged, double-edged sword because it's sharper than anything that we could ever come up with or think about it could come back. Scripture, to me, ladies and gentlemen, has been my biggest, best ally in all of my discussions. And I'm not gonna tell you that I can do it the best, as some people can, but like my awareness and the mindset is definitely set for me that I know that's how I need to react to these people. You got to keep hammering them with the truth of the word of God. Okay. And it, you know, and another thing is, is the soft voice turns away wrath. Remember that one. I've used that a lot in the past. You know, I mean, we could all turn up the heat of our wrath very easily, but you know, like a soft response turns away wrath. It's pretty cool. God's word knows it all guys. It knows it all. Um, to listen to, uh, listen to verse 23 of first Kings 18. So this is the, this is the challenge that, um, Elijah gives Ahab. He says, bring two bowls, let the prophets of Baal take one and kill it, cut it in pieces and put, put it on the wood, but don't light the fire. And I'll do the same with the other bowl. Then the prophets, they went first. Okay. The prophets of Baal, uh, then the prophet, let the prophets of Baal pray to their God and I will pray to the Lord. And the one who answers by sending fire, he is God. Okay. You know the Antichrist, some ladies, ladies and gentlemen, the deception is going to be so bad that he'll be able to call fire down from heaven. Interesting, huh? I told you many times in the book of Revelation that um, Antichrist, Satan is the ultimate parody. He keeps trying to imitate and counterfeit everything God does. Don't think that Satan hasn't forgotten this little challenge right here in the Old Testament. He's going to be trying to imitate God again in the future. There's going to be some incredible things that happen during the seven-year tribulation. And I, I hope and pray that anybody watching this video either is born again or will be, become born again and escape that wrath that's coming. Because we don't want to be here for it, okay? Now listen to this <coughs> challenge, okay? Listen to what the, how the people react to the challenge. The people shouted their approval. They're like, yeah, bring it on. Let's do this, all right? Let's do this little challenge. Let's see what happens. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since there's so many of you, and like just one of me, take a bowl and prepare it first. Pray to your God, but don't set fire to the wood. They took the bowl that was brought to them, prepared it, and prayed to Baal until noon. They shouted, answer us, Baal and kept dancing around the altar they had built, but no answer came. At noon, Elijah started making fun of them. Pray louder, he's a god. Maybe he's daydreaming or relieving himself, or perhaps he's gone off on a trip, or maybe he's sleeping. You've got to wake him up. So the prophets prayed louder and cut themselves with knives and daggers. Have you ever met any, any of those people that are like, uh, they're in cults or they they get all those Satan tattoos on their body or there's people that dress like gothic or whatever. They have this terrible demon that's hounding them that causes them to cut themselves. Like there's people 
I have seen and known in the past that literally have this problem cutting themselves. This is the same thing here, okay? Um, they kept ranting and raving until about the middle of the afternoon, but no answer came. Not even a sound was heard. And it says that according to the ritual, there was just blood flowed everywhere because they kept cutting themselves, wanting an answer from Baal. In verse 30, and then Elijah said to the people, come closer to me. And they all gathered around him. So he has all of the naysayers say, come on, naysayers, get over here, get by me and have a seat. All right, I'm going to show you what's up. Come closer to me. They all gathered around and he set about repairing the altar that the, of the Lord, which had been torn down. That's interesting. That's an interesting little sermon right there, isn't it? <laughs> um, he took the 12 stones, one for each of the 12 tribes of the sons of Jacob, the man to whom the Lord had given the name of Israel. With one of the stones, he rebuilt the altar for the uh, worship of the Lord. He dug a trench around it, large enough to hold about four gallons of water. Then he placed the wood on the altar and he cut the bull in pieces and laid laid it on the wood and said, fill, now listen, he's like, gonna, he's gonna double down on his challenge here. He says, fill the jars with water and pour it on the offering of the wood. And they did so. And he said, do it again. And they did. Do it once more. And he, and they, he said, and they did. And water ran down the altar and filled the trench. So like the false prophets poured some water on their offering and nothing came. And, and Elijah's like, I want you to, put down four times the amount of water that we put on your on your altar, okay? We're gonna double down on the water, triple, quadruple down on the water here. At the hour of the afternoon, the sacrifice of prophet Elijah approached the altar and prayed, here we go. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove now that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant and have done all this at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God, and that you are bringing them back to yourself. In verse 38, the Lord sent fire down immediately, and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, scorched the earth, and dried up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they threw themselves on the ground and exclaimed, the Lord is God. The Lord alone is God. Now there's your, hey, Asbury, there's your revival right there. All right. There's your true revival. Elijah ordered, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them get away. The people seized them all. And Elijah led them down to the uh, Kishon Brook and killed them. Wow. Can you imagine that revival? Executions after, you know, listen, like think about all these false prophets. You know what? If Elijah was here, guess what would be happening to those false prophets that are spreading all these lies, destroying our country in America? Yeah. 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 That's not very politically correct, is it? But that's ex what... Eli you know Elijah's going to be one of the fault, um, two witnesses, ladies and gentlemen? He's going to be one of the two witnesses. He might even be on this earth right now over in Israel. We're that close to the rapture of the church, you know? He could be over there in Israel right now. Nobody knows who he is, along with the other witness uh enoch most likely because neither one of them died a natural death um preparing there for their moment but this this man right here that we're reading about he's going to play a big role in the future and this world jerusalem and antichrist are going to get to see who he is it's pretty incredible we read about him the other day then elijah said to king ahab now go and eat hear the roar of rain approaching because ahab had called on a drought the Lord commanded him to call a drought on the land. So Ahab did. I'm sorry, not Ahab. Elijah did. And Elijah's going to have that ability to do the very same thing in the future during probably like the first three and a half years of the tribulation that we have coming up. He is going to literally be there again. Very incredible times that are coming, guys, in the world. And we're not even going to, the, the, the body of Christ, the church, we're not even going to be here for it. We're going to be in heaven celebrating, being very happy with God and Jesus. And we're going to get rewards we're going to know what's going on down here. We will definitely know. And I don't, I can't even pretend to tell you how that's going to be in the seven years, but it's going to be so amazing to be with the Lord. I can tell you that much for sure. Um, while Ahab went to eat, Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel where he bowed down to the ground with his head between his knees. He said to his servant, 
Go and look toward the sea. And the servant returned saying, I didn't see a thing. Seven times in all, Elijah told him to go look. The seventh time he returned and said, I saw a, a little, little cloud, little cloud, little puff of cloud, like a little, little Chinese spy balloon up there in the sky. It looked like a cloud. And he says, no bigger than a man's hand uh, coming up from the sea. Elijah ordered his servant, go, tell a go to King Ahab and tell him to get in his chariot and get back home before the rain stops him. And in a little while, the sky was covered with dark clouds. The wind began to blow and heavy rain began to fall and Ahab got in his chariot and started back to Jezreel. The power, here we go, guys. This is what I'm telling you. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah. The power of God's gonna come upon you and he's gonna come upon me, okay? And we're gonna finish our walk with God before the rapture of the church or whenever we're, we're, we're gonna be, we're gonna have the power of God. He's gonna come upon us. He fastened his clothes tight around his waist and he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So that's what I am, that's my message for, for, for the Christians who are discouraged, guys. Is I understand, I understand, but listen, you have God helping you. You have the Holy Spirit in you, living inside of you. Like, what do you have to worry about? Literally nothing, okay? Don't let all the bad news consume you. Like, think about the blessings of God, what he's given you, what he's done for you. I often take time to reflect on that in my life and all of the blessings that he's given me. And according to the abilities that I have, that I'm able to withstand because the Bible does tell us that he's not going to give us more than we can bear. Let me let me give you that scripture really fast. Okay. Okay, I wanna, I wanna give you this passage and then we're gonna be done, okay? First Corinthians, um, first Corinthians 10, 13. Let no temptation take hold on you such as is human and God is faithful. He will not allow you to suffer you to be tempted above which you are able to bear. Okay. So, you know, I mean, we get, that's regarding temptations and things like that, you know, but like, there's a lot of people that just feel like they can't handle it anymore. And I'm like, you got to remember wh whose family that you are, are a part of that you've been adopted into, you know, when you got saved, like, Really, honestly, I know that a lot of situations that we're in, in these tribulational times that we live in, it's not fun and difficult in our personal lives, but just remember which family that you're in, that the Lord who created the universe is with you and he will get you through it. He will get through everything and he does. He continues to carve out that path for me and I look like my life is a mystery. Going forward, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Most of you don't either. Don't let anybody try to be an Old Testament prophet on you and tell you that they know what's going to happen other than the scriptures, okay, that we know that's going to happen. And like our lives personally, we just got to trust in the Lord, right? And lean not on our own understanding. In all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will guide and direct our paths. That's it for today, guys. God bless you. Thanks for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. Blood, bought and born again, all of you at the group there. Um, we're growing. It's not exponentially fast, but we are growing. And um, we're a very tight-knit group of Christians. And uh, we love each other. We're praying for each other. Anybody that wants to join our group, let us know. Let me know. Send me a message. If you're connected with me, I'll send you the invite, okay? If this is on YouTube, like and subscribe this video and share the video, okay? And the whole idea of this thing is to give people hope, a future, like God says he has planned for us in a born again experience in Jesus Christ, okay? God bless you guys. Have a good night and I'll see you next time.